Side Hustle Show 281, how to start a $1,000 a month freelance writing business in 60 minutes a day. What's up, what's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show because you are not throwing away your shot. My guest today argues, convincingly so, thanks in part to his smart sounding British accent, that freelance writing is one of the fastest and easiest side hustles to start. So even if it's not something you see yourself doing forever, why not use the proceeds to build some flexibility into your life? I'm excited to welcome James Johnson from FreelanceWritersSchool.com to the show. He's a former broke shoe salesman turned world traveler and freelance writer extraordinaire. James went from zero to over $4,000 in freelance work in his first 90 days. And he says, if he can do it, you can do it too. Stick around to hear James's advice on selecting a niche, getting your first clients, pricing your work, and getting it all done. Notes and links for this one, along with a free PDF highlight reel with all of James's top tips from the call, are at sidehustlenation.com slash James. Now, you might not know this, but I've done a little freelance writing myself after writing for free for years and years on the blog and other sites. I gotta say, it was pretty rewarding to get paid for the words that I typed. And it was that gig, that first freelance writing gig, that turned me onto FreshBooks for the first time. FreshBooks is the affordable small business accounting software for side hustlers and freelancers with invoicing and time tracking built right in. Years later, I'm still a customer, so a big thank you to FreshBooks for sponsoring this episode of The Side Hustle Show and for helping 10 million entrepreneurs get paid. Ready to check it out for yourself? Get started today with your 30-day free trial at freshbooks.com slash side hustle. Are you hiring? Every business needs great people, and you might be thinking there's got to be a smarter way to find them than just posting your job online and praying the right people see it. That's where our sponsor, ZipRecruiter, comes in. Their powerful technology learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right experience, and invites them to apply to your job. That's why 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. Right now, Side Hustle Show listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash side. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash side. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. I'll be back with my top takeaways from this call with James after the interview. Ready? Uh, Let's do it. I wanted something that was uh, flexible, that gave me the hours to work when I wanted to work. You know, a job that you could do, that it didn't matter when you did the work as long as it was done on time. And I think I really liked that idea of just being able to work when I wanted to work from where I wanted to work and kind of, I I kind of started reading blogs and stuff at the time, like people like Sean Ogle and yourself and Benny Lewis and people were all kind of just building their blogs and you saw this lifestyle happening in front of you. I was like, I really want a part of that. I'd written from being a kid. It was one of the things I'd never quite realized I'd done, but you know, if I was stressed or depressed or happy or sad, I'd just grab a journal and start doing it. So I was doing like morning pages before I knew what morning pages were. So I was like, I've kind of got this random skill. Let's see how these kind of fit together. Okay. Was it something that you'd gotten paid for before? It was just like, ah, it's kind of a hobby of mine. I I lived out in America for a while and someone had asked, I was a personal trainer way back when, kind of before I was a shoe salesman, oh, that's a story for another day. And I got asked by one of my clients to keep a blog whilst I was out in America coaching soccer. And I just started keeping this blog and people started reading it and I liked it. And I was like, oh wow, this is really cool. And then it kind of tied in with everything else I've been reading and thinking about and the fact that I've been writing and it all kind of started to click into place. When I got back home and I took the job as a shoe salesman, about three months into it, one of my old personal training clients had started a business and asked me if I wanted to write a freelance, uh, write a book about strength training for him. I was like, yeah, okay, fine, whatever, don't mind, I've got nothing to do after work. He's like, oh, and I'll give you $300 for it. I was like, I can get paid for this. That kind of really hit me as I can start doing this now. I can then turn this into a business. So that was kind of like my pivotal moment there. Yeah, you find a ghostwriter for 300 bucks. It's a great deal for him. And you're kind of validating that somebody wants to pay for this. Yeah, exactly. Like to me, I thought like 300, like I was earning like what, 600, well, it was pounds or so 600 pound a month as a shoe salesman. I was like, someone's going to give me 50% of my salary for like a week's work because it was like a 10,000 words. I was like, this is incredible. Then you realize like, oh, that's not a rate I would ever take anymore. But in that moment, I was like, this is brilliant. It gives you that, like you say, it's that validation of your idea, of your skills and this can become something else. If you can do it once, you can replicate it. So that's how you got your start. So what happened next? Was there a concerted effort to really say, okay, I'm going to write in the strength training space, the personal health space, the soccer space? Or do you say, well, I'll take any client. I don't care. 
at the very start, it was that I would, it was kind of, I will take anyone that's paying me to write, really. I didn't really have a conscious thought about niches and picking all this sort of stuff. But I kind of found myself in the position that this guy had paid me. Uh, I got all the money for the book. And then I was like, oh, I have no idea how to get another client. But then it became, I wanted to replicate this. So I started to learn how to find clients, where to go and look for clients, what you should do. And then it became, uh, all right, there's lots of different people. There's so much to choose from. Let's pick four things I want to write about so I can filter out all the crap. Yeah, this is the hard thing that I've kind of come across is like I'm a mile wide and an inch deep in a lot of stuff. At least, you know, that's my perception of it. I'm sure, you know, relative to somebody who's brand new, like I'm a mile deep in some subject matter expertise. But so that was it, just like writing down five things that you kind of knew more about than the next guy and said, okay, I can write about this stuff. Yeah, pretty much like I was like, what, 20 one at the time. So I didn't feel like I was an expert in anything, but I knew I'd been a personal trainer for a while. I'd worked in retail for a while. I'd done some, I did search and rescue in a helicopter with my dad as like work experience for a bit. And I kind of knew like, right, I've done these little things. It was my mum that really came to me. When I, I spoke to her, I was like, I've got no idea what to write about. I've got no idea what I'm doing. I don't think I'm any good at anything. I'm not an expert at anything. And she was like, well, you only have to be a step ahead of the people that you're writing for. And that really kind of hit me. And she was like, look at all these things that you've achieved over the last couple of years. Which one of them can you do better? And which one do you enjoy more than what a beginner could do? I was like, well, there's this, 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 and this. And I'm intermediate at this. And I've done this and I've done that. And then that started to take the shape of my list. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. you got to be just one step ahead of, of who you're writing for. There's a great story about, you know, the guy from Catch Me If You Can, the Frank Abagnale person. Yeah, I saw the movie. The, the movie, yeah, there's a bit in the book about him that didn't make it into the movie where he was a, what you get? He went in, I think it was a university in the Midwest and he masqueraded as a sociology teacher for six months and didn't get caught. When the FBI finally got him and asked him, they were like, loads of stuff they were asking about. And that, they were like, this school thing, like, how did you teach at a school for six months and no one noticed? And he was like, well, I'd teach the kids one chapter and I'd just read the next chapter. So I was only ever one chapter ahead of them until he got to the end of the curriculum. And I was like, that's a brilliant way to look at everything. Just like, just have the just in time information just before you need it and then kind of give it back. And I think that's a great way to become an expert or something or to be that relative expert to the person you're speaking to. That's helpful, especially for side hustlers starting out. Like, look, you don't have to be the world's foremost expert on, you know, whatever topic it is. You just have to have an interest in it and be, you know, one step ahead of, of who you're writing for. So you, you mentioned, okay, I'm going to apply for jobs that kind of fit in those five categories or in those different niche categories. Like, where are you applying for this work? I started off back when it was Elance and Odesk, when it was two different kind of sites uh, before they became what is Upwork now. I started on there and I was looking for jobs and little did I know it wasn't the best way to start a business, but it was just a way to get started. So I got in there and I think I got in there at the right time just before it kind of became oversaturated, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit. I got a few clients on there and I was like, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of competition here. Let's move out. So I started looking into my local area and looking for businesses around me. But I lived just outside of Manchester in England, but I knew not many people were applying or trying to get the attention of these people around me. So I find businesses around me that I was interested in or that like tied into my niche in a certain way. And then I just write to those and I go, let's find all the businesses in Bolton, which is like a little town next to where I lived. And then, you know, you go, well, I'll do it in Salford, then I'll do it in Worsley and I'll do it. You don't know any of these places, but you know what I mean? You move around the area until you kind of, you know, then right, who's here, who's there, who's there. And you just kind of work your way through until you've reached your quarter of people you need to write to. And I found that was a great way. Being in your local area was so good. It was just an almost an untapped market because everyone's looking for the companies that are based in Silicon Valley or in Houston or in Austin or in LA or New York or Sydney or whatever it is. But no one cares about the businesses around me. So why don't I be the person that cares about them? And then I started looking in that direction. Okay, interesting. Was that just a pitch? Hey, you need blog content and I can do that for you? Yeah, pretty much. So there's two ways that it is a really good way and a really bad way. So I always I'm very I always make sure I tell people the times that I did it really badly as well. So the first thing I ever did was I got a business directory for Salford, which is the town I was from. And I made a point of going through and finding all the businesses that didn't have blogs and trying to convince them to start a blog and to hire me to run it which sounded like a cracking idea at the time. But at 300 pitches later, when everyone was like, why would we start a part of our business just to hire you? I was like, 
oh yeah, I didn't think of that bit. So then I started looking for businesses that kind of had like a, uh, that kind of had a marketing presence, you know, that were using social media a bit or had a bit of a blog or were making updates and changes to their sites. And then that just, I started to get more success with those kind of businesses as well. But it was literally find them. I had a bit of common ground because I'm from Salford, you're from Salford. Brilliant. You know, I'm a local lad. It'd be great if I could come down to your office and have a chat. This is before I really learned anything about pitching, but I just always felt let's be conversational, let's have a personality and let's give as much as I can before I ever ask for anything. You know, so I'd just come with like blog ideas and I'd be like, all right, you're, there was a transcription company that I wrote for, translation and transcription they did. And I was just like, here's like four ideas for your blog. If you want to use them, feel free to use them, even if you don't want to hire a writer, but I'd love a chance to write them for your blog as well and maybe work on a long-term basis. Thanks for your time, James. And then that was kind of it. It got a lot of responses because people were like, this guy's around the corner. He could drive into the office. We can have a chat with him. They'd pick up the phone or it'd be, a, oh, yeah, cool. You've given us four ideas. Write one of them. We'll see how it goes. And I thought that was just a great, just a great way to keep going. Okay. Yeah. I like that a lot. It's like, you're, you're giving something first versus just like hire me and going after the companies that have invested a little bit in social media. Maybe they've invested a little bit in their blog, their online presence, but you know, it's, it's less of a hurdle to convince them that they need more content than somebody who doesn't have a blog at all. Exactly. And I find that these companies tend to have uh, a budget for it as well. So like one thing I recommend to like the, the students that I teach at the moment is that when you're looking for a company or you're looking at someone to pitch to, look and see if they've got a blog, even if it's got a couple of like outdated posts or whatever, you know, that it's kind of, they posted in Ju July, then November, then February. And then, you know, but they've kind of got something going on there and they're actively trying to grow their business because they tend to have a budget to spend on that. And they're in a, they're in a growth mindset. They're in a spending mindset. So then you're just trying to tack onto that momentum and take a piece of that pie as opposed to trying to convince someone to get the wheels turning, which is really hard, which I've learned the hard way. Okay, tell me about Upwork, and maybe you've seen this from, from your students, because I've seen a couple of people in comments recently saying, not that Upwork is necessarily like closed for new freelancers, but it's becoming harder to get in. Like, oh, we already have enough people with your skill set. And it's like, well, geez, I just wanted a fair shake and bidding for the next job that came up. I don't know, what are you, what are you seeing? <laughs> I'm definitely seeing that. I'm seeing the, that there's a lot of freelancers that have built their entire business around Upwork, and it's not a a healthy way to build your business, I don't think. But because there's so many people that are now ingrained in this one tool, so their whole business lives and dies by it, it is much harder for a new freelancer to come and get into it. And I've also found that their business mentality has shifted from when it was Elance and Odesk, and now they've become one company. It's more okay. shifted to getting a good deal for the entrepreneur and not for the freelancer on the other end. You know how people use Fiverr if you want a quick design or you want a quick uh, logo doing or whatever it is. It's kind of become that kind of mentality from the other side. It's rigged for the entrepreneur to get the best deal, which is great if you're an entrepreneur trying to start a business on the cheap, you know, on a shoestring budget. But if you're a freelancer trying to make a good business and make smart business decisions and grow a business, you're constantly battling for low prices. And it's kind of the Tim Ferriss effect of the four-hour work week that was – you know, you can you can outsource really easily, really cheaply, get everyone, you know, get everything done really cheaply. People don't want to pay like $30, $40 an hour for things. They want to pay 8 to 12 And then there's more influx from people from outside the US and the UK and Europe where they can charge less and live on more. And that has already affected it as well. And now there is no competition really for Upwork in the freelance writing space it has become much harder to get a foot in the door and then to get the rates you want when you're in there compared to when I first started and maybe when you've used the site in the past as well and then the original side hustlers were really using it. Yeah. Have you played around with any of the other freelance markets like People Per Hour or Freelancer.com or even like Contena, which is um, kind of an aggregator for different writing postings? You know, I've never used Contenta before, so I, I, I can't say anything about that. But the other ones I have played around, I kind of like to be a bit of a crash test dummy as well. And I like to get involved and find out, especially when I'm teaching students about which one of these platforms is working, what they're doing, what you can get and what the benefit is. And I just find that for writers at the moment, content mills are not a great place to start your business anymore. They're trying to sell you the world and sell you this idea that they'll take all the worry out of looking for clients 
setting rates and your taxes and things like that, which are hard to do on your own anyway, but then they just kind of then rig it for the entrepreneur to win. And I, I'm all about protecting writers and about writers getting the most out of it. So I find that like even like people per hour and freelancer, it's almost a race to the bottom for the price you can charge. I will say on the other side of that, that it's good to have these as a tool. Like I'm all for someone spending 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour a week on Upwork, just seeing what's there or people per hour or whatever it is, just seeing what is on offer and what they could potentially take on. It's when you build your business around it, that like the sole source of your business comes from just Upwork or a content mill as they're known sort of in the industry. That's when it's a really dangerous place because it's easy to get into the mentality of if it's not on Upwork, if it's not on Freelancer, it doesn't exist. And then I looked, there's nothing there, there's no new jobs, oh, I didn't win it, let's go and watch Netflix. When there is a whole world outside of that for you to explore, which is scarier because it's not in a easily narrowed down place like a content mill. But I'd say from sort of the middle of last year and especially starting now, like you can go straight in at the job board level applying for stuff and build a just as successful business just as easily. Okay, so what would be an example of the job board option? So a job board would be, so there's maybe a site like freelancewritingjobs.com is one where they pull sort of the best jobs from around the internet every day. Or Pro Blogger Jobs is another great place to start, especially if you want to do content writing. Because I find that with job boards, because the person has to pay to be there, so they have to pay to post that job, that they're normally a little bit more invested in it. And you often get some big companies there who just don't know where to look for freelancers. They've never had to look for a freelance writer before. So they just go, all right, this place has got someone's good, a good name behind it. Lots of freelance writers go there. Let's look at that. And the pay is usually a lot higher. Like I found even back way back when, when I moved away from it, that my income doubled just going onto job boards away from Elance or work. So like starting how you can get a better level of client and you can combine that then with other like proper job sites like Gorkana Jobs is another one where they kind of promote remote work and promote different sites that are looking for that as well. So there are lots of options out there and you can kind of diversify where you're looking as opposed to a content mill where you're just worried about what's there in front of you. Sorry, what was that last one again? The last one, that's Gorkana Jobs, G-O-R-K-A-N-A. It's kind of like Indeed, but another one, they have a lot of journalism jobs and stuff on there. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll link that stuff in the show notes for you as well. James, did it help that you had a little bit of a portfolio built up when you started kind of transitioning to these job board type of postings? Or do you think somebody brand new could go in there and be like, hey, look, I got nothing to show you, but I promise I'm going to be awesome? Very good question. I think having a portfolio really does help. You you, you need to have a portfolio behind you, but the question then comes about how you build it. No one has ever asked me in my life if I have been paid for a portfolio piece. They only care that it's been written. So I would say if, you, if you're brand new, maybe just before you go into job boards, look for blogs in your industry where you can go and get a guest post done on there, where you can go and guest blog and write, you know, 10 reasons your cat likes the Smiths or whatever it is, whatever your niche is, whatever it is, you know, as long as it's relevant, go and get published on there so that someone has endorsed you. Because I find that social proof and maybe you feel the same way as well, that if a freelancer comes to you, you don't want to be the first person to take a risk on them. You want someone else to have done it first. So you know that you're getting something that has been worked with and been molded a little bit more. I'm with you there. In, in fact, I mean, that's how we connected. You sent a guest post over, an excellent guest post on kind of the upside down business model, or what you called the upside down business model for freelance writers. You talked about a really, you know, a step by step way to go find clients. So it's like, dude, this is awesome. Of course, I'll publish that. And I really appreciate you doing that as well. But so let's say I had nothing at that point, and then I'd managed to get a guest post on your site. I've then got Nick Loper's name behind me. I've got a side hustle brand behind me and you've endorsed my work. So then if you go to the next client, they're like, oh yeah, that dude has endorsed your, he's endorsed his work. Let's have a chance at him. And guest posting, I find the stakes are a little bit lower than going to a paying client. So like if you were to go to a paying client with just uh, Word documents attached to an email, one time in 10,000, you might get a look in. But as soon as I see emails like that, they just get 
delete it straight away because I know that I've got to put in a lot of work into that. Whereas if I go, if someone comes to me with four guest posts, I don't care if they've ever been paid for it. I just know they've got a link. It's been shared. They've got comments on it. It's been well received. I can see it out in the open. They've published out in the open before. Bang, let's give them a chance. Yeah, so this is, hold up your initial email. So I found this from uh, May of 2017. This is guest post opportunities. That's the subject line. So this is an example of like you writing for free to build up this portfolio to eventually get paid customer or paid clients. So he goes in, hey, I'm James. I'm a shoe salesman turned side hustler turned full-time writer. I write at Freelance Writer School. I'm also a member of your Facebook group, right? So like building some of that, you know, connection, some of that rapport there. He pitches three different ideas. One of them is the upside down method for finding freelance writing clients. He has a couple other pitches in here. And then he includes kind of the social proof down at the bottom. By the way, if you want to get a feel for my style, see some of the other content I've created, here are some of the other articles that I've written. And he includes uh, Matthew Woodward, which is a big site in kind of the SEO internet marketing space. He includes Niche Hacks as another example of an article that he wrote uh, or a site that he wrote for. And then Buffer with 4,000 shares on the Buffer site. And so it's like, okay, this is a very good, a very good pitch. Like clearly, you know, you know what you're doing. Yeah. And I think there's a couple of techniques I use in that you can probably see. So like you said, you build a rapport with the person that was like, when I, came, when I was talking about the local area thing before is just having an instant kind of connection with that person to go, all right, this dude's not just here. Just going, Hey, how are you? Give me money. It's this person has already invested and kind of at least made an effort to do that. And then when you got down to the the what you call it, to the portfolio pieces side of it, as it were, the samples, that social proof, being able to, I always pick the best thing to put next to it. So if I'm writing a pitch, I'll say Matthew Woodward, a link and the full headline of the post. And then next to it, it'll say like either 68 comments as one of the articles got, or, yeah. you know, it's got 4,000 shares. And you don't even have to read the post to know if it's any good. I create so little work for you in that respect because you go, all right, it's been shared 4,000 times on a blog that I know. Okay, cool. It must be it must be of good quality. And then you can decide to read it if you want, but you're already then on my side. That's what if you do guest blogging for another site, you can put this thing in it as well. You can say, it might only be a small blog, but you can say, I have, uh, you know, I was posted on whatever website it is. It got 40 shares and 30 comments and it was top on their website for a week. That's a brilliant way to then just, create that social proof and that endorsement again. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. And I kind of like, you know, you're kind of building, you need building your own luck here in a way, you're not, we're totally reliant on these job boards, not totally reliant on these other, you know, other platforms, because now you have a way to go out and, and pitch clients. So we'll link up the upside down method, which I think is brilliant way to go out and get business in the freelance writing space. Anything else you found effective for, for yourself? You know, you mentioned the local thing, you mentioned the job board thing. And I don't know, either for yourself or for clients for getting started. Guest posting is one of the best things that I've done. Like one guest post that I wrote for, I think it was the co-schedule blog, has earned me more than $20,000 in freelance writing income just from one post that I got paid to write. So like having that level and being able to direct people back to your site is really good. I'd say personal branding on social media is really good as well. If you're okay, really hold the, Slow down, slow down, slow down. So co-schedule paid you to write a piece. Yeah, Call Schedule paid me to write a piece as a client thing, but because it was a, it was done as a inverted commas guest blog, it then had my bio at the bottom. Okay. And then they go through to that. They click on the link in there that takes them back to my site, and then people will just go, "I really like that post you just read." Yeah, can you do one of those for me? <laughs> would you want to write for me? And I'd be like, "Yeah, sure. I don't mind. I, like I, 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 I like it." You can then build this kind of automation. You can't rely on it. You don't have as much control over it. But then I find that people that come to you through guest posts, they're invested in you. They want you as a writer. They're willing to pay more. They are willing to negotiate with you better. And they really just, they're really invested in the work that you do. So you go into that with a position of power as opposed to cold pitching where you're kind of trying to persuade someone else. They're trying to persuade you. Yeah, absolutely. They're seeking you out specifically versus, you know, posting a job on Upwork and be, well, I need, I need a freelance writer. I don't know where to go. So here I'm going to this freelance marketplace and, you know, we'll see what comes back. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Uh, people buy from people they trust and that they like. And if it's connected to a brand they like and you've written content that they like, they've just got a really good feeling going into it, which is great. What other stuff has worked? LinkedIn is a great tool to take advantage of. You can find a lot of people 
that are connected to a business as opposed to just looking for businesses to pitch to or for clients to pitch to, you can start to find like content managers and you can start to find, you know, you can put in say motorsport and management in there and just, uh, and uh, marketing, sorry, and see what comes up and you will find people that run blogs. You will find people that work for a motorsport blog or people that are really interested in motorsport and know somebody runs a blog and you can just find these people and then lists of companies in their bio that says, I've worked for this person, I've worked for that. And you go, right, they've worked for these four companies. I bet one of them's got a blog. Click on that. Go to their website. Oh, they've got a blog. Brilliant. I've got someone else to pitch to now. Or you can even just make a connection with them on LinkedIn and start to build the report that way. That's more of a longer game thing. If we're trying to focus on the sort of everyone here is just getting started, it's just a great way to compile companies that you could pitch to. From the first 300-pound job, to taking this full-time like was there a point in time where you're like okay this can be a full-time thing like curious you know what that transition was like and it seems like unless the gigs are recurring it's still kind of this feast or famine like oh am i going to be able to find enough jobs this month curious to get your take on that from the minute i got a taste of it i was adamant i didn't want to be a shoe salesman anymore and <laughs> i just wanted this new life so there was i worked in a shoe shop that was dusty and awful and my boss was a prick i can say that because this is the wild west of things and it was about the sewage from the plant over the road and you were earning minimum wage and working 10 hours a day and it was awful. So I knew I really wanted to get out. So I, was, I kind of forced myself to be able to, I kind of made sure I wanted to do it. Now, the way that I got around feast and famine is that I created a, a simple business model. I say I created it. It's definitely, it's been around for ages and it's, I call it the numbers game because it's really simple. And what I used to do is that I would track how many pitches I sent, how many responses I got, how many of those responses converted into paid work. And then if I knew that that was 10, 4, and 1, I could then do the math to figure out how many pitches I needed to send to get four responses to get one new client. So if I ever needed work, if I ever needed to pick up a new client, or if I knew I needed to make another $300 $300 that month if I wanted to add another client to my list. I just knew I needed to send 10, 20, 15, whatever amount of pitches it was that would then get me these four responses that would then get me the one client. Okay. And that was just a really simple way. And it sounds really simple and almost too simple to do, but it really does work. If you can figure out that you're getting, that for every 20 pitches you send, you get five responses and that leads to one client, you know you need to send 40 pitches to get two clients. Sure. You need to send however it was. And the maths does work out. And you can then see where your business is kind of uh, falling down. Like if you're sending 50 pitches, you're getting two responses, but you're getting one client out of it. You can see that you're obviously just pitching to many of the wrong people because you're really good at negotiating because from those two responses, you've converted someone. You know, But you then need to narrow down who you're pitching to. Whereas if, you can set, if you're sending 10 pitches – you're getting nine responses and zero conversions. You, know, you need to figure out your negotiation, your offer, what it is you're trying to do, whatever's happening in this little bit. And then you get to a point where you've got four or five clients that you can work with. And then you start sending out emails and you're like, hey, if you really like the work we've been doing, do you know anyone else who might be interested in this? Do you, know, do you want to do this on a monthly basis? Should we maybe say that we do £2,000 a month and you give me X amount for that per month? And we'll just do that indefinitely until it goes. And once you've built enough relationships with people, that stuff just happens. Like I went a year without having to get a new client and my income was doing very well because I just set myself up to this almost subscription model, retain or whatever it is you want to call it. You pay me this amount per month, I'll do this amount of work, all's fine and dandy. And then you just do that. And then you can kind of, you've just got to get through those first few months of slogging it out to get the first few people under your belt and playing that numbers game to then get to a point where there is no famine anymore. You just that you just then get to decide how much of a feast you have. We all like the feast part. I like that. James, thanks for sharing. The, the, I was just curious about like, okay, how much of your business is one-off versus recurring? It sounds like, okay, if we can set up as much of it to be recurring, that kind of reduces some of the stress and then knowing your numbers on the pitch to response to conversion rate. Uh, that, was, that was really cool too. The higher level of client you have, the more likely they are to want to keep you on. And it sounds odd, but the, the more money they have to give you, the more likely they are to keep you on for longer term, especially in blog content writing or marketing 
sort of direction writing, there's a constant need for it. They need it every month. They need it every few weeks. So they are very happy to keep you on longer. So I, I've not had a one-off client for a very long time now. Okay. Can you give us a picture of what an article, you know, what you charge for an article these days? I'm thinking from like, okay, for, from charging 300 pounds to write a book to, you know, I imagine the rates have gone up considerably uh, since then. So, you know, what's a, what's a typical project for you today? So my current rate per thousand words is $300, which is all right. It's kind of, I, I feel it could be higher, but I'm quite happy charging that at the moment. I'm enjoying charging that, which is quite good. I have a couple of clients that are still a little bit lower that are kind of clients that I've worked with in the past that I'm now trying to build up and I will change my prices with them as well. But that's kind of it. But then what also comes into that is the length of articles that I write. I specialize a lot in long form content. So I'll write like a, a short article for me is 2,500 words. And then they just get longer from there on out. And I've ri- I write whole SEO guides. I write kind of, you know, 100,000 word things when they need to be written and stuff. So it works out very well. Yeah, that makes sense. So when you're talking 300 bucks for a thousand words, the content mill stuff, like when I think content mill, I think of sites like um, text broker or like hirewriters.com where you could go probably 12 or 15 bucks for a thousand words, you know, on the very, very low end, you know, whether or not it's going to be legible, whether or not you're going to be able to make heads or tails of it is probably debatable, but that's kind of like, just to give yourself an idea of like what the price floor might be like at the very low end, what people are charging. I've seen other people go up to a dollar a word or more. So, I mean, you're kind of right there in the middle and exciting to see what you built. Now, does it bother you that it's like, okay, I still have, I'm self-employed, but I still have employers. I still have clients that I have to serve. I still like, it's not passive. Like if if I ever stop working, like it dries up, like, does that stress you out? Or is it like, I'm cool with that because I have the flexibility? Sometimes it does stress me out, especially when I'm traveling. You've got jet lag, you're in the back of some dodgy hotel and you want the Wi-Fi to work and it's not working. I've got a deadline in six hours. Please turn that router on again. And then it it kind of like stresses you out a bit. But because I enjoy the process and I enjoy writing and I enjoy the ability to be creative, it doesn't bother me as much. It's a, a necessary evil for me. But I do... I would like to create more passive income. That's part of why I've started the freelance writer school is then to give me something else on the side that I don't have to be there for when kind of the, what do you call it, for when the exchange happens of money kind of things, you know, so the passive income side of it. It doesn't stress me out as much. It is tiring at times, especially like I said before we got on the call, I wrote 10,000 words in two days. That is then stressful and you have to try and take a weekend off after that. Yeah. But I'm kind of, yeah, you know, you, do, you kind of have to be flat out with it. But I knew what I was getting into when I did the job. I know it's part of it. There are times in my life where I'd be like, it'd be great if I could just sit here and not have to do any work and get paid for it. But then I've also seen the other side that like the stuff I'm writing, some of that stuff is what people have to write on their own before they ever get paid and it might fail. So the other side of that is that as a freelance writer, you lose the risk of writing some 10,000 words, investing what is what can be two weeks into it and it flopping. Because you go, well, you know, you're not completely resolved because if it flops, part of it's on you as the writer be like, well, I've got paid. (laughs) Well, I've written those articles before where it's like, oh man, you know, you pour your heart into it and all this time. And it's like, that was just landed like a dud, you know, it was not, it was not a hit and you kind of live and learn and hopefully try and do better again the next time. But no, very cool to be, look, I removed that risk from the equation. The guys asked for, the client asked for 10,000 words. So here's 10,000 words on the topic. I'm gonna do it to the best of my ability. And then it's kind of in, in their hands. Are you at capacity or can you, could you take on more work? Is that an issue that you're running into? So with trying to build a second business on top of a freelance writing business, I am kind of at capacity at the moment and I've kind of reached the amount I can do. But I also set very strict boundaries, except for certain times where I have to write 10,000 words in two days because my time management messed up. I kind of set strict boundaries. I know how much I want to work every day, how much I want to work every month, where I'm going to be, and I can just plan that all in. And I also plan in extra time to go, you know, that you know, you probably have these days yourself where you get up, you have a coffee, you sit down and you go, nah, nothing's coming out of my head today. Nothing. There is no way a word is getting out of me onto that page. And you have to go and do something else because that's just how the creative mind works sometimes. So on that front, what do you do when you're like up against a deadline? You got this writer's block going on. I don't know. Like, How do you combat that? Deadlines are a great motivation to get stuff <laughs> from like, I don't think I've ever had writer's block the day of a deadline. It is almost impossible to have because it's Tim Urban talks about the panic monster that pops up when you've been procrastinating. And that just then happens and you are then forced into writing something. 
But I find that like you've kind of got to give your creative mind a bit of space as well in the fact that, you know, if you do sit down and you can't write anything at that point, like it might only be a space of like half an hour before you can finally get into it. But just giving yourself the break to get up, go away from the computer, go for a walk, go for a swim, go to the gym, change your physical state or your mental state. Like I find that meditation really helps. If I go, if I'm really having writer's block, if I go and stick, bang the headspace app on for 15 minutes and sit and chill and come away from it, grab a cup of tea, come back and write, I'm in a much better place. Okay. That makes sense. Any other tools or resources that you like to speed up that process or, you know, help out with the research or anything? Yeah, there are loads of different tools. I think Sumo is a great tool just to go and stick keywords into and see what's kind of trending at the moment, see what people are talking about, see the articles that are getting shared, all the different things that are going out there at the moment. I think that that's a great way just to, like, that's why lots of creatives have swipe files, which is just like a, an Evernote document or whatever it is, just filled with articles you like to read because you might read something and get inspiration. And doing that from a trending topic can give you a lot of different ideas. I also like using askthepeople.com where you go over to the site, you stick in your keyword for whatever is the topic you're writing about, it might be photography, whatever it is. You stick it in and it will come up with lots of different wheels of questions that are being asked in search engines around that topic. So it could be anything from what are the best photography filters through to where are the photography classes in Arkansas. And you can kind of pick out all of the different questions and start to build a article from there. I think another another cool one, and you, you know, this is kind of like the upside down method a bit, and I kind of, you know, I like these little hack things, is go to Udemy, the course website, just go to Udemy, in the search bar, type in your keywords, so we'll just go photography again, click on one of the courses and look at the course curriculum, and you have just got a full article layout there in front of you. It goes from introduction. So it, like, if you click on like a photography course, it'll probably say introduction. What are filters? Which is the best filter to use? Which filter should I use when it's sunny? Which filter should I use when it's dark? Which lens works best with this filter? And you just have all of these different topics and sections. And this is content that someone's paid for. So you know it's content that's good, especially if it's got like five stars. And some of them have six figures worth of five stars on their, of their reviews. And you can go in there and you've just got a full content idea straight away. And you can just pick and choose from that what fits what you want to write about. And that can get the creative juices flowing as well. So I think, you know, Buzz Sumo, Ask the People, and Udemy are three great ways to kind of get over that writer's block. So this, uh, I think it's Answer the Public. Is that the one? It's like with the yes, creepy old sorry, guy on the, the front. Public. I have lied. Answer the Public. You are right. Answer the public, buzz sumo, and then looking at the curriculum inside of certain Udemy courses on your topic. I've done the same thing with Amazon's uh, look inside feature. You look through the table of contents for certain books on your topic. That's a great way to kind of build the outline for uh, for what you need uh, for what you need to write. Very cool, um, James. You can find him at Freelance Writers School. Dot com. He obviously knows his stuff. Definitely worth checking out over there. Let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. Focus on income generating activities. If you've got a million decisions to choose from or you're really struggling about what to do, do the thing that is going to help you make money in the next couple of weeks or in the net, in the short term. Just focus on that until your business is going and then you can start looking at the long game, but get that capital first. So focus on income generating activities until your income is where you want it to be. Absolutely. I love it. Revenue solves a lot of problems. James, thank you so much. We'll catch up with you soon. Thank you very much for having me. This edition of the Side Hustle Show is brought to you by FreshBooks.com. And I've got another phone-in testimonial for you this week. This is Miranda Marquit from PlantingMoneySeeds.com and Adulting.tv. I use FreshBooks and I have been using FreshBooks for several years now. And I love FreshBooks because it gives me the chance to quickly and easily invoice clients and get paid. There are so many great features on FreshBooks from recurring invoices to templates to the fact that I can easily log in and see my dashboard and see who has paid and who needs a reminder to pay me. So FreshBooks is a great way to get paid. The fees are pretty low. And if you choose the e-check option, you can also get a discount on your PayPal fees. So not only does FreshBooks help me get paid faster, it also ensures I save money. 
Visit freshbooks.com slash side hustle to start your 30 day free trial today. That's freshbooks.com slash side hustle and enter the side hustle show in the how did you hear about us section. All right, my top takeaways from this call with James. Number one is to use all available methods for getting clients. That would be marketplaces, job boards, you know, local businesses, pitches, LinkedIn, guest posts, because you won't know what works and what doesn't until you give it all a shot. I think James is a great marketer, but it's clear he's also tried a bunch of stuff. And what's cool about his business now is he has this body of work that exists online that leads to people seeking him out directly instead of just posting a help wanted ad and hoping somebody good comes back. But there are lots of different ways to land freelance clients. So it's not like this is a single point of failure business that relies 100% on SEO or Google ads or something like that. So that's takeaway number one, you know, shotgun at the beginning to figure out what works to get business. Takeaway number two is don't be afraid to work for free, at least at the beginning. So James's guest posts got him some really good exposure and even landed him, like he said, tens of thousands of dollars in additional work. He's written for Side Hustle Nation before, an excellent actionable article. I don't know if it's gotten him any business, hopefully it has, but it's definitely helped him get um, on the podcast um, and something um, sometimes you got to prove yourself for free or for less than you'd like to make long term if you're serious about starting a business or a side hustle writing I think it makes sense to practice the craft of writing on a daily basis and if you don't have a buyer for those words or those articles at the beginning um, maybe they're relevant targeted guest posts or at the very least blogging on your own site I think that can be a good way to get your work out there so don't be afraid to work for free or for less than you might ultimately like to make And then takeaway number three is to level up. Content is the currency of online business, or rather uh, great content is the currency of online business. But great content doesn't create itself, and it's not easy or cheap to make. Now, you heard Matt Giovannisi on a recent episode say a great article might cost five or $600. And James said, hey, I'm at $300 per 1,000 words, and an average article for me is 2,500 words. So already, he's uh, north of, what is that, 750. So if you like researching and writing, it doesn't take many clients or projects to make a meaningful income out of that, but it means leveling up, becoming a better writer, taking on bigger, better paying jobs. I heard on another podcast recently, a guest comparing parenting to video games. And I can relate to this with little hustler number two in the house now. But he said that um, in his comparison, he said every challenge that comes up in parenting is, uh, is just like a video game. It's a chance to level up like these crazy hard challenges. Those are like a boss level. So think about that as you're leveling up your side hustle, if it's in freelance writing or whatever else it might be in. And I think that's a good place to wrap this one up. So keep leveling up in business and life. Be sure to hit up SideHustleNation.com slash James to download the free PDF highlight reel with all of James's top tips from this call. And hit the subscribe button in your podcast player app to make sure you never miss an episode. That's it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of the Side Hustle Show, where you'll meet a guy earning 60 grand a year from his part-time blog on a topic he knew nothing about when he started. I'll see you then. Hustle on. Thanks for listening to the Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com. 